So this uh, final plenary panel for uh, today will be about uh, IoT and regulation, or actually wider, about um, IoT and policy. And with the explosion of uh, IoT, there is also um, an explosion of discussion around the rules of the way, the rules and the regulations and the policy that can help IoT to advance. And sometimes it's actually an explosive discussion, and perhaps some of those points of contention will also come up this afternoon. Whereas it was the original intention that here we would have a panel with four speakers due to uh, the situation, the act of God, uh, we will now uh, have a somewhat different format. We will first have a presentation by Mechtel Rowan, who I'll introduce in a minute, and then we'll talk a little bit using the opportunity that she is here as a policymaker from the European Commission to talk about what is this policy making actually about? And how could you, as companies, as business, perhaps also as cities, be active in policy making? What does it mean for you? And then we'll get Rana Sen in, who will give a perspective complementary to this, and we'll get into a further discussion. And if time permits, also questions, of course, from your side. So, uh, this panel can touch upon difficult issues like data protection, cyber security, liability, but not perhaps only those horizontal topics that affect Internet of Things, but also the relationship to all of these interesting sectors that we see in the rooms outside. Health, energy, transport, cities and what have you. So let's have an interesting policy exchange here. And I invite Mechtelt Rowan to join on the podium. Mechtelt, uh, very welcome here. Mechtelt is um, a key policymaker in the field of Internet of Things in the European Commission. She is the heading the unit that is responsible for policy in this field, as well as responsible for a very substantial investment in research and innovation, I believe in the order of 1 billion euros a year. In policy making, you will hear uh, what is happening right now in the European Commission, and that's, of course, a work that is in progress. And then we'll take her into a further debate about the contents of that and the ways of policymaking. Mechtilt, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is, as Paul said, uh, a panel with uh, two panelists and one moderator, and it's not a one-woman show. So uh, it's, uh, it's trying to introduce you to, to the policy making around the technical area you are familiar with. So my, my, this, the, sh the title of my short speech is indeed IoT, the European Union perspective. And uh, indeed, um, I'm there, the head of unit Internet of Things, but not only dealing with uh, policy making and legislation making. Uh, just for you to understand, I'm somebody with a technical background, so I had to work hard to, to dig myself into this policy making and, uh, and legislation making. I don't need to tell you much about the importance of IoT, uh, that it is a key growth area, that it is a huge opportunity for Europe, that we are still uh, claim we have leadership and we want to keep it we internationally cooperate with partners from all over the world, um, and we see how the market is really growing and will exceed 1 trillion euro by 2020. I cannot even think of the many zeros you have, uh, what, what trillion means. Um, why do I tell you this? Um, a year ago, the European Commission thought, yes, this area is very important, and then decided uh, to create a new unit, uh, Internet of Things, in the, let me say, Digital Directorate General. You can call that a Ministry for Digital Affairs. And uh, I was given uh, the task to be the head of unit of this, of this unit, and I was saying, yeah, this is, this is what I wanted because I remembered in my uh, computer science studies, I did a master thesis, which was already on driverless vehicles. So I said, okay, now I see in practice what was theory when I did my, my master thesis. So 
The Internet of Things unit was created mid of last year, and our mission is indeed to be the center of competence for IoT uh, in the Commission. That means we are responsible for research, for innovation, for ensuring the accelerated take up of the technology, for standardization, and last but not least, also for policy making. What is behind that? I will explain in a few seconds. Our context is. Uh, in the digitization for European industry strategy, which was adopted last year, and it is, it is a wider strategy which encompasses much more than, than uh, IoT. But our goal is indeed to ensure the digitization of European industry and ensure the competitiveness of your in European industry. And my job is that to do that for the area of uh, IoT. Um, this strategy for the digitization of European industry included an action plan for IoT, and this is based on three pillars. For those of you who want to know more about it, there is a nice document uh, from April last year which spells that out in more detail. The pillars are, first, we want to achieve a single market for IoT. What does that mean? It means that IoT devices and services should be able to connect seamlessly in a plug and play basis anywhere in the EU. And we work on many initiatives around interoperability and also standardization initiatives. Secondly, we want to create a thriving IoT ecosystem. That means we want open platforms to be used across vertical silos. So we do not, we do not go for vertical solutions, but for cross-sector solutions that will help uh, developer communities to innovate. And uh, as a kickstart, uh, IoT deployments in a selected number of lead markets um, have been uh, started and, and are supported by us, the so-called large-scale pilots. We, are, we have started beginning of this year five big projects with the funding of 100 million euro behind it. In, in the areas where, where we believe there we are the front runners, First, it is in the connected and automated driving. Secondly, smart health, wearables, smart cities, and last but not least, in smart agriculture and smart food. And I, I remember the, the, the last question of the previous panel. I was happy to hear that, yes, we have a large-scale pilot on smart agriculture and smart food, and uh, we have all in the supply chain involved, from the farmer to the equipment supplier. Finally, our, our third big pillar is we want to achieve a human-centered IoT. What does that mean? It means developing technologies, policies, and regulations or legislation, respecting European values, empowering people along with machines and businesses, and not the other way around, uh, to, to keep high standards uh, for protection of personal data and security, and notably, and that is mentioned in this action plan explicitly, a so-called trusted IoT label. I come back to that later. Some of you may have heard it, and also the big debates and discussions we have had about this in, in, in Europe. This is indeed the pillar of this, uh, of this action plan, where indeed policy and legislation initiatives are started, uh, in particular relating to how can we build and achieve trust of the consumer in the technology? How can we improve the security? How can we improve the liability of these uh, systems? Meaning, what happens if things go wrong? Who is liable and who is responsible? So our IoT implementation strategy uh, to build IoT ecosystems distinguishes between a series of innovation activities and initiatives uh, and then uh, a number of policy initiatives. You find them summarized here on this, on this slide. Our large-scale pilots, I mentioned, are an important element of that. But what is also important is we support stakeholders and stakeholder discussions, in this case, the Alliance for Internet of Things Innovation, AIOTI. Several of you may have heard about it. It, it has now some 200 registered members as a formal uh, association under Belgium law, and it has been developed out of a commission initiative to create such an alliance, but now it is formally established uh, as an uh, association under Belgium law. We also 
support international cooperation, in particular currently with countries like Japan, Brazil, South Korea, US, India, these are, they have come and uh, indicated their specific interest in putting also their money into this, into the cooperation with European uh, companies. And under the policy measures indeed, we aim to provide appropriate regulatory conditions to facilitate the creation of the IoT single market. And I have mentioned already the keywords cybersecurity, liability. Um, for cybersecurity, I do not need to tell you how important it, it is. Um, this implies also that, that we need to work in particular due to the many different cyber attacks and the, and the significantly increasing number we, we notice, not only relating to IoT, but in, in, in general, that we have to work on improving the security aspects of IoT. And this means for us, first of all, to help creating and increasing the trust in IoT. And, uh, and we do that looking across different sectors and we look into the minimum common requirements for trust building and for improvement of security uh, across the sectors. This includes in particular measures for uh, uh, supporting uh, security and privacy by design and by default. It includes also encryption for data confidentiality and integrity. And finally, it includes uh, the creation or the establishment of a proper liability uh, regime. Now I come to the very concrete actions. Uh, now, what is the role of, uh, of, first of all, of governments and policymakers in, in this? Um, okay, our measures are industry oriented. We, we see the need to intervene when uh, the market fails sometimes to create uh, a market for all. Um, secondly, we need to create market-oriented policy measures. Um, that includes also skills, uh, education, awareness raising, and so on. We need to ex uh, explore a possible framework for ICT security certification, and we identify and accelerate the development of standards. I will now, now focus only on the cybersecurity and the certification uh, for a framework therein. The package was adopted on the uh, 13th of September, and it was, uh, is a proposal made by the Commission, which now goes for discussion with the Member States and uh, with the European Parliament. Um, in view of billions of devices connected over the Internet by 2020, and the dramatic rise of the cyber criminal activity, um, the Commission has made a proposal um, to reinforce the EU's resilience and response. And one important element of that is the creation of the security certification framework to increase trust. With that, we hope it is a governance structure with well-defined no roles of stakeholders therein, meaning the Commission, a cybersecurity agency, the member states and the authorized uh, representatives for certification in the member states. Um, it aims to avoid fragmentation and barriers in the, in the digital single market, and it avoids the one-size-fits-all for certification and labeling. Those who have thought about labeling and discussed that know that uh, you cannot have one and a single label for, for all different areas of IoT technology or application areas. So this now offers an opportunity to create certain or different certification schemes for different needs so that we do not aim anymore at the one-size-fits-all approach. It offers the possibility also for labels and marks. And finally, it aims to bring benefits for citizens, users, vendors, and, and providers. The second package um, we have adopted uh, in September this year is the second data economy package, the first package uh, was adopted in January this year. Um, this now aims at a regulation for the free flow of data, of non-personal data across the borders, and uh, the aim is to increase the legal certainty and trust for, for businesses. 
Um, one important aspect of, of the data economy package from the IoT point of view is the liability issue. What happens if things go wrong? Who is liable? Um, this is an issue where we, and now I'm on my last slide, um, where we focus uh, in the context uh, of IoT on the assessment of the current legislation schemes and rules we have in place, the so-called product liability uh, directive. Is this directive, which is 20 years old and ensures the liability for traditional products still fit for purpose for the emerging technology such as IoT or artificial intelligence or also uh, robotics? What about the role of data in this context? What if a damage occurs and a liability case occurs where, where the data was corrupted or data got lost? Um, what about the inclusion of AI methods and technologies, uh, including machine learning? What if a connected car and an autonomous car has an accident and the car was trained by, uh, by different drivers? Uh, we cannot identify anymore the basic concept of the liability directive, which is the defect. Uh, when, when such a, uh, a case occurs, you cannot identify uh, uh, a defect. So who has to provide proof that something goes wrong? Currently, it is with the user or is it with the producer? Um, what role do voluntary and mandatory insurance schemes uh, play in this? And uh, these are the many open questions we are currently dealing with. And I, I use that as an example to probably explain also to you, and we, we discuss that later a bit more, how you as industry can get and should get involved in policy making and in legislation making. We have certain mechanisms, processes, and procedures in place which invite you to participate, but it may be that you do not know. But I think we will come to that uh, during the course of, uh, of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mechtel. So, uh, Mechtel, thank you very much for this uh, really IoT and, and, and regulation focused presentation. But actually, I want to use the opportunity that we have Mechtel here, who I know since a long time, I have to admit, that you get to also know her a little bit. Because I think it's actually quite interesting uh, for uh, people who are in business. Um, who are responsible for IoT technologies and uh, business models and business out, uh, rollout, what is a policy making, uh, maker actually? And so, Mechtild, um, you have a background in, in research, in technology, but also a long background in policy making in the European Commission. You have been doing a lot of work, for example, on e-government and now IoT. What is that you actually like about policy making? What motivates you? Before I started and I got involved into the policy making, I was involved in research and innovation. And when you do research and innovation, you focus on the technology and you touch on, let me say, the societal impact of what you are doing a bit at the borders. When I got the opportunity to step into policy making, first of all, that was a difficult jump for me. Uh, uh, I was a bit reluctant, but I was then tempted so much because I found it so interesting. Because there you can see the impact of what you are doing. When I do yet another research project and yet another one, I see a technological output, but I do not see which impact does that have probably on the life of my mother or my sister or, uh, or my friends. And stepping into policy from a technological background, at least I thought brings into the policy making also this, this element of not being a lawyer, because uh, lawyer's thinking is, is for me something I still need to learn, although I have a unit now in the meantime, it's almost 20 people, but three of them are lawyers. So you see how the focus of my work has changed. And the, what, is so, what is so interesting is that you can intervene in 
in day-to-day -day discussions where you can see at the very end or not if you fail, <laughs> that it has an impact what you do. And sometimes we need also to do attempts right. where we've, we've, we end with a failure in sense of, no, it doesn't make sense to proceed yeah. with that, then we put it aside. So policy making is not uh, something that is over with just uh, a piece of policy or law that is introduced. One of the difficult things about policy making is for sure you need to bring all kind of interests uh, together. So how does that work in practice in something like the European Commission? So the European Commission is a policy making body that helps, uh, so to say, citizens, business, governments in Europe to, to run uh, and design Europe. And part of what uh, the European Commission does is policy and regulation. So how does that work with all these different interests? Um, we work following a multi-stakeholder approach. If we start thinking about a new piece of policy, not because I'm just dreaming in my bed tomorrow I want to make policy on A, B, C, D. No, we see from practical implications, from industry, from uh, projects, where we should probably do something and where an initiative is needed. When we, when we identify this need, we follow our multi-stakeholder approach. That means we involve in our consultations with a wider uh, audience uh, all the different stakeholder groups, being it either uh, the industry who is supplier of the, industry, uh, of, of the technology, in, in the case of IoT, or the, the association of users, the consumers, also they have, have a right to express their views. We also need to talk to the member states and their representatives who are active in policy making in that area, not for everything what we believe uh, something should be initiated. The European Commission has the competence and the rights to do it. We can do that in any case only in the cooperation with the member states. We also need to talk to people in the European Parliament because if finally a proposal, uh, what I for instance uh, introduced before for a, a cyber security certification framework is to be adopted. This is only the first step. The Commission has made a proposal. This is now discussed with the member states in the European Council and then also with the European Parliament. And finally, these three need to come to an agreement on the approach. That means changes can still happen. And you are responsible for digital policy, but that means you also talk to the people who are responsible for transport policy or energy policy or data protection. Yeah, this uh, I, I, I have forgotten to say. Indeed, um, IoT is, as a technology, worth nothing if you do not use it in certain sectors, areas, application domains. That means we talk to, or I talk to my colleagues in other DGs, that is ministries, for instance, the Ministry for Agriculture, the Ministry for Energy, the Ministry for Health, and, and discuss with them what we believe should be done and, and to, to get their point of, of view and to integrate that in any policy making yep. we are doing. And when I then need, and you may say, okay, you as an IT person, you do not have contact with the, with the uh, customers and the, the, the people outside. How do, you, how do you reach out to the group of farmers or farming equipment manufacturers? I go via my colleagues in the, in the Ministry for Agriculture because they have their constituencies and their stakeholder groups coming from, from that area. And if needed, I bring all of them together to see where is the horizontal line from agriculture, energy, health for cross-sector platforms and so okay. on because we do not need to reinvent the wheel every time uh, we talk about a new application. Yeah. I think what you see from this there are many uh, interests coming together and often they can also be conflicting. For example, it might be that some people feel that if you start to regulate it conflicts with innovation or it conflicts with the speed of technology. And that's perhaps a good moment in time to ask Rana Sen uh, to join us. Rana is from uh, Deloitte and he has more than 18 years experience in leading government uh, transformations in public health and human services in transport and finance. And uh, he is um, also the lead on IoT and smart cities within uh, the US uh, Deloitte uh, public sector practice. So I thought it was an excellent moment for him to, to give us some reflections on, so how do you deal with all these kind of tensions from the perspective of uh, uh, Rana, you yourself, Deloitte, yeah. Uh, thanks, Paul, and I think, um, 
as you said, you know, I, uh, I'm a consultant, so I have been working with government agencies in uh, helping them with their strategy or technology deployments. So I probably have a bit of a complementary perspective to what uh, Ms. Rohan has been talking about. Uh, and uh, I think there's sort of maybe three points uh, I'll uh, suggest first uh, for this audience and then maybe get into a discussion. Number one is the current um, Catch-22 situation. You know, the policymakers and the regulators um, are uh, somewhat hesitant given the large number of unknowns in IoT. Uh, um, but then the private sector also uh, uh, is looking for some level of guidance um, in, in, when it comes to IoT deployment and, and, and data, uh, which is actually slowing down the, techni the technology adoption, which in fact is impacting, again, regulators. So that's kind of one catch-22 situation that we are in. Um, the second thing I think is that we need to uh, probably look at uh, policy and regulations and make sure that we understand the differences because I think we often in interchangeably use those terms. You know, policy is being more around guidelines, whereas regulations are more of detailed mandates that need compliance. And I think, th you know, where IoT is today mostly is needs more policies and maybe little less of regulations, uh, depending on which phase it is in or which domain. And thirdly um, is this notion of IoT, which goes beyond just the actual sensors, you know, goes beyond the actual creation or deployment. It's an information value loop. And uh, when I think about IoT, when our clients think about IoT, they think about how the sensors are communicating. We think about how we're going to aggregate the data coming out uh, of the sensors uh, and how we're going to analyze the data for decision-making purposes to make it useful. And I think policies and regulations need to address, and maybe there's a different bit of a nuance in each of these different aspects of IoT rather than a one-size-fit-all approach. Yeah, yeah. If I continue on that, and that's perhaps also a question to the audience, so you can also jump in. What would you name as the most difficult issue that we need to address with policy in uh, IoT right now, and why is it so difficult? Well, I think uh, there are um, you know, issues of uh, uh, governance, of um, uh, and, uh, uh, methodology as well, kind of rethinking the whole policy-making, at least from our perspective. I know you, know you have a lot of more experience around policy making and the protocols thereof, but looking at the uh, methodology of uh, you know, uh, outreach with the uh, consumers and making it more of a constituent experience-based approach, um, thinking about customer segmentation, things that the private sector follows, right? An example would be, uh, in the US, um, we have the Transportation Security Agency. And initially, when it all started, there was a one, one set of um, uh, regulations for all passengers going through the airports. But then it evolved into more of a segmented approach where if you sign up uh, for the pre-TSA program uh, and you go through certain background checks, then the set of rules that apply are limited because you have voluntarily uh, opted in uh, for the checks, right? So certain approaches of customer segmentation can be applied as well. Yep. Um, and then the governance aspect of it where you have you know, the siloed approaches, but if you take a lead agency model uh, where one agency you know, takes the lead, other agencies collaborate, uh, those would be the areas where I think this is yeah. the challenge. So, so that's really uh, doing governance so that you deliver customer value, and that's also in uh, policy design, which is actually one of the things that you're confronted with if you bring all these interests together. So what's for you the most difficult topic right now? What would you say for IoT? Uh, in technical terms, it is this discussion, a lengthy discussion I've had do we need an IoT trust label uh, in order to, uh, let me say, increase the trust of, of users, of consumers in the technology? Um, there we had a broad spectrum of different camps 
um, between all the suppliers from those who were very much in favor of having it immediately uh, to the other spectrum, I said, never, ever, too costly, too slow, will hinder innovation. And from the policy point of view, the, the most difficult is and remains is to strike a good balance between um, pushing and allowing for innovation while at the same time uh, protecting consumer interests. Uh, and that, is a, that is, is, is a bit of dancing on the, on the rope and that is a learning process, that is a listening process from our side, that is also bringing those different uh, con stakeholder groups uh, together. And the difficulty is indeed how to strike, how to strike the balance. Yeah, yeah. For this uh, issue on the IoT trust label, um, at, the, uh, at a certain moment of time, I gave up not I gave up, I stopped discussing label yes or no because the discussion got so stuck and the camps were so confronting each other that we did not make any progress. So I, I turned the discussion upside down and tried to have discussions with all. What are the minimum security requirements our devices should match and should fulfill? What are the criteria? And then brought this in and that they could talk, they could again talk to each other, they could also talk across different sectors and they found a lot of common uh, commonalities. And what we finally have now done with this cybersecurity framework, we have set up a, a system of rules, a governance structure, uh, which allows for the definition and the setting up of different certification schemes. Okay. Uh, and, and, uh, the outcome that, can be yeah. more than one scheme. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to raise uh, a point, this is a really difficult issue and you policy makers need to look at that. Please feel free to raise it. I see a hand going up. Uh -huh. Hello, um, thank you for the interesting conversation. I am Angeles Navarro and I work at a cloud-based uh, software company in France. Um, so it's Open Data Soft, and we are we have a problem uh, to be able to enter the market because of regulation, precisely. So we are finding that uh, for local governments, it's very difficult to buy, let's say, a cloud-based platform, and so they end up picking or, or opening tenders for something that is going to cost them five th five times more. Um, so how would you address this yeah. type of, uh, that's, of problem? That, that's, an, that's an excellent question. Perhaps, Rana, you have a lot of experience with cities. So how do cities must be struggling with that? <laughs> oh, they are. And, and that's uh, actually a valid, um, valid concern because I think uh, we have seen it across spectrum where um, many of our clients have moved uh, to the cloud, but many of the uh, other clients, because of the uh, pre-existing regulations, um, in, independent of the, uh, the value-based argument, um, are, are not able to move to that platform. However, you know, one of the things that many of the cities uh, and other government agencies are trying to do right now is doing these uh, small-scale and sometimes medium-scale pilots as well within the existing regulation uh, framework. So they take a sp specific use case, they work with the current um, uh, mandates, but then they have a pilot to demonstrate the value of certain innovative services, be it cloud-based, be it IoT, or be it something else. And then that you know, convinces the policymakers around moving away from the current set of regulations. So that's one approach uh, in doing so. And the other thing which is actually, um, I would say the federal government is doing quite, a, quite well these days is um, in US specifically where they have a lot of the innovation grants available. So you can apply for these as cities um, and do some of the projects in a more innovative uh, in a manner and help demonstrate the value so that you can yeah. move away mm -hmm. and help uh, change the regulations as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, the session is uh, about to end. This is a fairly short session, but I still do want to give the possibility if someone has a question. Yeah, please. Hi. 
Uh, my name is uh, Bassam Zarkoud. I'm with IGN Power in, uh, in Canada. Uh, thank you for the panel. Um, question to the panel about uh, GDPR privacy implications on all of this, uh, maybe on the European side and as well on the Deloitte side, on the US companies operating yeah. in, the, in the Europe. I would have been surprised if GDPR was not raised here, so <laughs> you fulfilled my expectation. Um, let's give um, just a few seconds for each to give an answer, and you will certainly have to talk deeper. What's happening uh, in the GDPR? How is that relevant for IoT? And perhaps what is the US view on, uh, on the data protection method? You want to go first? Uh, yes, um, the GDPR gets into full swing in, in May next year, and whatever we do respects and must respect the new rules for the data protection. And I think every company operating in Europe has to do this uh, as well. We consider that as an, as an asset for, for Europe, for European business and for European uh, consumers. Uh, I know that in other parts of the world this is probably viewed a bit differently, but um, for the IoT area, um, Data protection uh, and privacy is for us a very important element. And I, referred, I refer back to what I said initially in my presentation. Human-centered IoT for us includes also the respect of data protection and privacy rules. So that's an important aspect. In Europe, data protection is, is, uh, is actually a human right. It's one of the fundamental rights. Yeah, and let me just make one uh, general comment. You know, if you if you think about it and step back, you know, um, transnational trade over the years, you know, has established, you know, pretty solid regulations, and we understand that, right? Data is, it's relatively in that in that scheme of things new, and we also understand that there are some different legal conceptions of privacy. Uh, and I think being sensitive to that is what is necessary at this point in yeah. time. Unfortunately, I know there are more questions, and feel free to still uh, bottle them with that, <laughs> with those questions. But unfortunately, we have to end this uh, panel time. So many thanks, Rana. Many thanks, uh, Mechtil. Many thanks to you as an audience. Thank you. Thank you very much.